Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thanks to you. Maybe you're Kelly Cook or Scott Hepburn or Jelf Wilkes or our brand new patron, Douglas. Everybody, welcome, Douglas. Hey, hi, Douglas. On this episode of DTNS, CES 2024 rolls on, and we have battery developments, matter casting, and Molly Wood tells us about the flying car. Wait, Van, wait, she'll explain. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, January 9th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. In Las Vegas, I'm Molly Wood. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Yes, I'm not in L.A. I'm in L.V. <laughs> That's right. I, I, I Ron Burgundy myself <laughs> there. That's exactly the joke I was going to Are you too. Tom Merritt? <laughs> I'm, I'm Tom, Tom Merritt. I'm in CES. I don't really know, actually, <laughs> after being in CES for a few days. Uh, we are going to uh, get to a bunch of CES news. We've got some non-CES news first, then a bunch of quick CES news, and then we're going to talk to Molly Wood about some batteries and some airplanes. So, Molly, thank you for your patience just while gonna, we wade through the 3,000 right announcements. Coffee. Yeah. yeah. For the video viewers, you can just kind of give your your reactions as as we uh, perfect. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's start with the quick hits. Apple has announced more details about the Apple Vision Pro shipping February second. Pre orders begin January nineteenth at eight a.m. You can use it with a solo knit band or a loop band, which will both be included in the price. You also get a light seal, two seal cushions, a cover, a polishing cloth, a battery, a charging cable, and a power adapter, all for the low, low price of $3,499. Optical inserts are available for $99 if they're just reading glasses, but $149 if they're specific prescription. If you want one, you will need to act fast because analyst Ming-Chi Kuo believes the demand combined with his supply estimates, it it should sell out after it is available for pre-order or sale, resulting in a longer shipping time. Apple also updated Xcode to let developers submit their Vision OS apps to the App Store. And of course, as with all submissions, there are guidelines for what will be accepted in Apple's Vision OS App Store. Among those guidelines, Apple asks developers not to use the terms AR, augmented reality, VR, virtual reality, XR, extended reality, or MR, mixed reality, to describe their apps. Instead, they should call them spatial computing apps. Uh, that is so Apple of Apple. <laughs> the Chinese state-backed Beijing Institute claims it has cracked Apple's airdrop security and can identify the phone numbers and email addresses of senders who share content over airdrop. A representative for Beijing's ju- Judicial Bureau told Bloomberg, quote, it improves the efficiency and accuracy of case solving. The Beijing Institute has not commented on how the claim hack is done, beyond saying that it involves accessing an iPhone's encrypted device log, which Hmm. would require the phone's sending and or receiving information to be confiscated. Meta announced it will expand the type of posts it restricts from being shown to teens on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, Users under 18 will no longer be able to opt out of the restrictions on content uh, that Meta determines is harmful, uh, and in the case of 16 years or younger, sexually explicit. That includes searches and posts shared by friends. Uh, Restricted content includes self-harm, graphic violence, and eating disorders, though posts about recovering from an eating disorder is not restricted. Facebook and Instagram's algorithms already don't recommend such content, but now teens won't see it anywhere, even if they're searching or friends post it. The European Commission said that it is examining whether Microsoft's $13 billion investment into OpenAI and the deep ties between the two companies laid bare as a result of OpenAI's board mutiny back in December should be vetted under the bloc's merger rules. EU Antitrust Commissioner Margaret Vestager said, virtual worlds and generative AI are rapidly developing. 
it's a fundamental that these new markets stay competitive and that nothing stands in the way of businesses growing and providing the best and most innovative products to consumers. San Francisco-based video game software provider Unity Software is laying off 25% of its workforce, about 1,800 employees. CEO Jim Whitehurst wrote in a memo to all Unity employees, we're reducing the number of things we are doing in order to focus on our core business and drive our long-term success and profitability. Now, Weishurst didn't provide specifics on structural changes to come, but a company spokesperson confirmed there will be additional changes coming. Uh, this is the fourth round of layoffs the company has conducted since July 2022. So even employees who didn't get laid off today still have to wait and see over the next several months whether they're going to get laid off or not. This story technically happened at CES since it was announced during a press event in Las Vegas. But SAG-AFTRA, that's the Actors Union, has reached an agreement with Replica Studios to license actors' voices for use by AI in video games. The agreement includes minimum rates to replicate a voice, limitations on how long a replica can be used, and some safe storage and transparency requirements. It does not allow for the choices to be used to train language models, however, but they will continue to talk about making that happen in the future. The union is still negotiating with lots of other video game companies, and the workers authorized a strike to happen if that is needed. All right, that's the non-CES quick hits, Molly. How'd you do? Great. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, the I Apple thing almost contain. broke here. Yeah, no, it's okay. I could not yeah. contain my laughter All right. about how you can now refer to this 70-year-old technology Spatial under computing. Apple's new rules. Yeah. All right, let's get into the CES quick hits. Intel announced a lineup of 14th gen mobile and desktop processors. The Core HX series of desktop replacement mobile processors comes in five flavors. D tell me if you love these flavors. Mmm, 14. Core i9-14900HX, delicious Core i7-14700HX, mm. Core i7-14650HX, Core i5-14500HX, and of course, every kid's favorite, the Core i5-14450HX. <laughs> Get in my belly. Mm, delicious. Uh, the Core HX layout will be identical to their 13th generation Raptor Lake predecessors, but with faster peak speeds. So these are not Meteor Lake. These are Raptor Lake. The exception is the Core i7-14700HX, which gains an extra four efficiency cores. Company also revealed 18 new desktop processors, a sampling of models include the $549 flagship Core i9-14900, 24 cores split between 8 performance and 16 efficiency cores, runs at a base of 65 watts with a peak draw of 219 watts. In the middle is the 14-core i5-14600, that one's $255. At the bottom is the 2-core Intel processor 300, a mere 82 bucks. Like the mobile counterpart of the desktop core, i7-14700 gains an extra four efficiency cores, and a subset of chips will also come in F, meaning they don't have integrated graphics, and T, meaning they are power efficient, low power variants. Intel briefly showed off a physical example of its next-gen mobile processor, Lunar Lake. At the Intel Client Open House keynote, Lunar Lake uses on-package memory, which should interest thin and light laptop makers because it eliminates the space needed on a motherboard for separate RAM. Uh, but that's similar to what Apple's uh, M-Series SOC does as well. Sony had some announcements uh, announcing a spatial content creation system that seems more like a hollow lens than an Apple Vision Pro although kind of remains to be seen. It will let professionals create 3D models while wearing the headset, running on Qualcomm's Snapdragon XR2 Plus Gen 2 platform with 4K OLED displays. The front part of the uh, headset will flip up to let you switch between virtual and physical spaces. It was demonstrated with two controllers, a ring and a pointer. Sony showed it being used to work on a robot. We don't have price yet. Coming later this year, though. Also, Sony's EV collaboration with Honda is still in the development stage, but Sony showed off the Accela again by driving it on stage using a PlayStation DualSense controller. 
MSI introduced its Claw handheld PC gaming device running on Intel's Meteor Lake Core Ultra processors, meaning it can upscale graphics with Intel's ZSS tech. has a 7-inch 1080p 120Hz IPS LCD screen, claims two hours of battery life under a full load. Pretty good. Also uses Hall Effect triggers and joysticks. Uh, Hall Effect triggers and joysticks don't uh, use magnets, so they don't have the touching parts, so they don't wear out and drift and all that good stuff. Has a cooling system with vents, runs MSI. Size Center M software on top of Windows 11. So that's how you get your shortcuts to games. Also has an Android app player built in. You can do it with others, but this one makes it easy. MSI Claw models range from $699 to $799, shipping in the first half of the year. The Claw. Anchor showed off two new Qi 2 chargers at CES. Qi 2 is compatible with Apple's MagSafe. Uh, there's a foldable 3-in-1 called the MagGo wireless charging station that goes for $110. A 6,600 milliamp battery MagGo power bank for $70. And the 8-in-1 MagGo magnetic charging station, a.k.a. the Orb, for $100. The power bank does attach magnetically although it's too big to carry around practically in everyday life i don't know i mean unless you just like carrying things around however it has a foldable bit so you can turn it into a stand the orb has two usb a ports two usb c ports and three ac outlets so theoretically these could all work with android devices once there are more android devices that support g2 and Anchor isn't the only company with Qi 2 devices. Satechi showed off its own. Uh, nice looking stuff, too. A little bit pricey. One's a folding stand that can charge earbuds on the base and a phone on the stand. The other adds the ability to charge an Apple Watch on the back. Uh, both will be available in Q2. $80 for the 2-in-1 and $130 for the 3-in-1. Asus announced the ROG ROG Phone 8 series running on Qualcomm's Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 chip with a 165 hertz display and a 32 megapixel front camera. It also has a IP68 dust and water resistance and conduction cooling system that uses boron nitrate. It also features an improved 50 megapixel camera. 50. Hmm. And Zenfone's six-axis hybrid gimbal stabilizer to improve low-light shooting. The ROG Phone 8 starts at $1,100. Coming in February to the UK with Europe and US releases dates to follow. And also, a lot of you know that Asus took over the old Intel NUC design. Asus announced its first mini PC for gaming, the ROG NUC with core ultra CPUs up to an NVIDIA RTX 4070 GPU and support for 4K displays and Wi-Fi 6E, but you know, still no price release date yet. Lenovo announced the ThinkBook Plus Gen 5 Hybrid that can be a desktop or laptop and an Android tablet. When used as a laptop, it runs Windows, but you can remove that display, which then becomes a fully functional Android tablet. The remaining part can still operate like a desktop with the addition of an external monitor, obviously. The two computers do not share files automatically, though, so you can't keep working from one and then you know, go over to the other without manually syncing or using the cloud. The ThinkBook Plus Gen 5 Hybrid ships in Q2 starting at $1,999. Mm, that's, a, that's a cool looking one. I'm hoping to see that one tonight at uh, Showstoppers. Uh, then there's the Lenovo Tab M11. It's just a nice 11-inch Android tablet with a 90 hertz display, but it's 179 bucks. Not bad. Lenovo says it will keep it updated from launch in April 2024, through 2028. So, I, I mean, it's not that long, but it's long for a tablet. Good job, Lenovo. Nicely done. Let's talk about robots. Samsung first showed off a spherical robot called Bally at CES back in 2020. Remember that, days? Mm. Well, it's back. It's the size of a bowling ball, last two to three hours on a charge, and its spatial LiDAR sensors can help it navigate as it rolls around and can project 1080p video for movies or video calls or work, whatever you might need as a second PC monitor. Seriously, it automatically adjusts the picture based on lighting and wall distance. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a smart robot. You can control it by voice or text messages. It can also uh, control smart home devices, even some non-smart devices with an infrared transmitter. But 
As always, no price or release date yet. Just like in 2020. Uh, Samsung also demonstrated a new kind of foldable display called the In-N-Out Flip. It looks like a Z Flip, like a Galaxy Z Flip, with a 6.7-inch display that folds up into a clamshell, but it doesn't have a cover screen. However, you can also fold it the other way so that the screen is on the outside, not the inside, and now your cover is only screen. Samsung also demonstrated something it called the flip lipple. Come on. Molly. That, that, uh, <laughs> the flip I don't like lipple. that. No, lipple is just a portmanteau of light and simple. Obviously. Lipple. Yeah, yeah. Just, or is it lipple? Why wouldn't, you, why wouldn't just, you call it that? Is it lipple? Anyway, it's meant to be a... <laughs> it's meant to be a more affordable option uh, because instead of having a cover screen, it leaves part of the main display visible for notifications when folded. So it doesn't match up. It leaves a little bit on purpose. Uh, no word on when the Lipel or the in and out flip might come to actual shipping devices. Oh, I how you very sweet. me because I got the notification on my Lipel. <laughs> I don't know. I, I hate it. Every time anyone says Lipple, I'm like, ooh, Lipple. It's so upsetting. <laughs> Pivotal brought its Helix Personal VTOL VTOL aircraft to Pepcom's digital experience last night to celebrate its announcement that you can now order one for $19,000. The lightweight aircraft doesn't require a pilot's license, but you will need to get some training from Pivotal in order to use it. The FAA forbids flying these kinds of Part 103 aircraft near airports or over congested areas. Helix gets 20 miles of range and takes 75 minutes to charge. The first models will start delivery in the U.S. Uh, starting on June 10th. You can place an order with a non-refundable $250 deposit but you'll need to secure your production date with a further $50,000 within five days. So you when, really, you really want to, you really need to want it. When one of our rich friends buys these, will you ride in it? Uh, yes. The answer right. is yes. All right. There we go. Yeah. Uh, Wait, can I ask a clarifying question? Is it $19,000 or $50,000? Or is there a $19,000 version? That well, is a very good question. Uh, the because nineteen thousand dollars hundred hundred ninety thousand dollars not nineteen okay there we go hundred ninety thousand dollars that makes that sense. I was does like, change things grand, somewhat I it. was like I mean I don't have nineteen thousand but like I was like oh, okay hundred nineteen okay I'm priced out um, yeah. if anyone who is very wealthy would like to fly me around I'm I'm your man <laughs> and you know who you are yeah. all right. Uh, that's a look at all of the quick hits. We made it. Yay. Yay. If you can't get enough Android in your life, uh, we've got a show for you called Android Faithful. Every week, Android aficionados Ron Richards, Wen Tui Dao, and Jason Howell bring you the latest Android news and information. And you can watch it live right here on this same channel, youtube.com slash daily tech news show, twitch.tv slash good day internet, Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, or just get it when you want it by subscribing to the feed at androidfaithful.com. <laughs> Uh, if you've ever listened to a podcast hosted by Molly Wood in the past couple of years, you might have run across the topic that lithium mining is a little controversial. Uh, in fact, that's where I learned the most about it. Uh, Sweet. But the demand for batteries with lithium is not going away. In fact, it's expected to rise 10 times by 2030. Microsoft and the U.S. Pacific Northwest National Laboratory announced a new battery material they call N2116 that could reduce lithium use by 70%. Uh, Microsoft used Azure Quantum Elements, which doesn't have anything to do with quantum computing, confusingly. It combines a lot of deep learning, machine learning type of stuff with Azure supercomputing to kind of turbocharge your AI development. Uh, and it was able to take tens of millions of possibilities and narrow them down to 18 potential inorganic materials that could do the job of reducing lithium in two weeks. That's faster than the usual couple of years it takes just to narrow down the possibilities. And then from inception to figuring out which of those worked and making a working prototype took nine months. It's a solid state electrolyte, which makes it less volatile, as well as possibly holding more capacity and longer battery life. Uh, so, and not just battery life when you use it, but like the battery would last longer before it you know, stops working like lithium ion batteries eventually do. Uh, so far, the new material has been demonstrated powering up a light bulb and according to Fast Company, running a clock that they bought on Amazon. 
and then That's modify it. Awesome. Uh, the implication here are both for lithium conservation, of course, sustainability, uh, but also the effects of AI on the speed of research and development. And Molly, you've been following this space really closely. Uh, what's your first impression of this? Yeah, I mean, this has been the, you know, when people sort of say AI is going to, it's going to fix health and it's going to be great for transportation and this and that. And then they, they go, and also climate. Uh huh. And and this is one of the big hows, actually, because materials research has been a key blocker in moving forward. A lot of these technologies, particularly battery technology, lithium is you know abundant, but mining is ugly and it's expensive to get, and it's just mm -hmm. this kind of whole complicated situation. And a lot of it lives in Afghanistan and China and things like that. So, the ability to speed up this kind of materials research, which a lot of scientists say is, it's like basic science, right? They, when I did How We Survive, which was now what, I don't know, five years ago oh, or something, yeah. I don't know, four right. years ago, time has no meaning. Um, <laughs> I interviewed scientists working on battery technology and they were like, it's a 40 year job. There's just no getting around it unless AI can speed it up. Mm, and this is one of the first big examples of AI speeding it up. This feels like a really big announcement. Yeah. yeah. So so two two years to two weeks is the big big stat it's there, bananas. right? Because you, you look at the nine months and that that's good, but the nine months is from the millions of possibilities to the working prototype. So I feel like the nine months is kind of fast in development, but that's probably what it would have been otherwise. It would have been the extra couple of years of figuring out the the actual ones to test. And you probably would have had more to test than just the 18. The nine months feels fast too. Yeah. And it could be as a result of the materials breakthrough, like something that's less flammable. Uh, okay. And you don't have like to better do options. Better options, but it still feels fast. And then the final hurdle will of course be the speed to commercialization. Like great, sure. you're, you're yeah. around a clock, mm -hmm. <laughs> when do you get in a car? <laughs> yeah, and we don't have any word on that. This is just them saying, hey, we made it work. Right, I'm yeah. not trying to buzzkill it. No, no, but it's that's- just a, a three-step process, and that last one is hard. It reminds me of when your favorite author's book gets optioned for a movie and you get excited about the movie, but then it takes decades for, you know, for it to actually turn into a commercial reality. Yeah. Totally. Hopefully this won't take dec decades though. Uh, if you don't want to wait for these new batteries, Anchor also announced a power station on wheels called the Solix F3800. The unit itself is 3.84 kilowatt hours, but it can reach a max of 26.9 kilowatt hours if you add enough expansion batteries, which you have to buy separately. Uh, it can output up to 6,000 watts of dual voltage. Combined with a second one, you can get 12,000 watts and 53.8 kilowatt hours. You're talking about $10,000 or so at that point, but that's roughly enough to power an average U.S. home for a couple of days. It can also connect to solar panels so that it can recharge and act as a portable generator. It can even charge an electric vehicle. Anchor is also bundling them into kits that will include power panels that you'll need if you want to power your home with it. You'll need an electrician to install those, but it would let the Anchor work as a battery backup for your house. There's also a transformer for collecting energy from solar panels. If you have those, you can buy that as well. It's a little box, though not one fixed to a wall. If you know Anchor announced a wall-mounted battery, they did that last year year and it's expected later this year this is different than that this is a little more flexible than that uh the solix f3800 is shipping now starting at four thousand bucks and of course one of the heritage whole home battery backup makers ecoflow also announced their home battery backup the delta pro ultra uh, that can take in power from up to 42 solar panels scale up to 90 kilowatt hours uh, you can get the delta pro ultra now for five thousand seven hundred ninety nine dollars the electric panel to connect it to your home is an extra thousand eight hundred ninety nine and of course you still need an electrician to do that but uh, kind of cool to have these kinds of options right i would done really done. like if anybody is you know has been playing around with the stuff um to say like this has saved me x amount of dollars yeah right versus you know the traditional way of just you know paying um paying uh edison or yeah, whoever yeah. well because the ecoflow can actually charge from your main power your your edison or whatever uh at, at non-peak times so that it's cheaper and then give you the power at peak times yeah, I think that math does exist and there are increasingly programs. What I think is really compelling actually is the programs by utilities that are going to start to give you a rebate or a break or money back. Like you can already opt into things like the Nest program where mm -hmm. they automatically yeah, adjust your power and then you get like a $200 gift certificate. But I think we're 
getting toward a universe where utilities are going to have to give sort of more proper kickbacks. Although, honestly, for people who have dodgy power and <laughs> turns out across America, yeah. that's a huge thing now. Mm. It's less, you know, it's like the, the, the savings is still being able to work and not having to throw away all your food and yeah. not freezing to death in your house. Yeah, yeah, right. Which, that, could, that could be worth it on its own. Uh, we told you ahead of CES that there would be a lot of Matter news. Sarah, there's more Matter news. Yeah, Matter is about to matter more. <laughs> At CES on Tuesday, Amazon announced a new AirPlay-like feature called Matter Casting with the goal of making it easy to send video from an iOS or Android device to Amazon devices, those devices being Fire TV boxes uh, and Fire TV sticks, the Echo Show 15, for example. Now, Amazon doesn't have its own smartphone ecosystem. Kind of tried back in the day, just didn't stick. So, at first, the feature is only going to send content from a Prime Video app to Echo Show devices. So if you have one, great. Fire TV support coming in the in in the coming months. Content from platforms like Plex or Pluto TV, Sling TV, Stars, ZDF, eventually. Matter casting is part of a bigger announcement that Amazon previously made alongside Apple and Google for Matter-based smart home appliances. But I think we're 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 starting to see some real use cases here. Yeah. I, I, theoretically, you could see Google and Apple, who are part of the Matter standard, do Matter casting. Practically, I'm not really expecting it anytime soon, but it's good to see Amazon uh, putting it out in the marketplace a little more. Uh, and on the note of smart home stuff, Google is expanding its smart home integration, announcing Tuesday at CES that its Google-based LG TVs, plus some Google TV and other Android TV uh, products, can now function as Google Home hubs without you having to get a Nest device. Although, if you do have a Nest device, that will still work as intended. Um, Molly, does any of this uh, sound appealing to you? I mean, how have we been podcasting together for this many decades? <laughs> and we're still trying to figure out what can... I mean, we spent half an hour <laughs> yes. before the show trying to figure out what way to send some things to well, you into this is and that Should I do the, the iCloud link or the Google Drive link? But I only see the, your AirDrop, but I only yeah. see your phone, not your computer. What and if I you just emailed just it as an, oh, there's an attachment. Just email it, but then I sent you the link, but then you can only get the videos but not share the link. Oh, it's an H-E-I-C. So, like, oh, I don't really want to hear about a thing that can only cast from this to that mm, for now. And for now. also, aren't they no longer making those things that it can only cast to? Like, aren't they, like, deprecating no, no, the whole electronic? No, they're still line? making the Echo Show. They're, I mean, no, oh, okay. There were a lot of rumors that they were going to cancel it, but they haven't yet. And they, oh, well, then they I feel confident in investing a lot into that. I, I feel like those rumors were exaggerated by some. We'll, <laughs> maybe that's just me. Anyway, you see where I'm going here. Yeah, All yeah. these walled gardens. You're, 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 uh, you're not jumping into the matter pool yet for matter casting. Per, per no. Yeah, yeah. I gotcha. mean, the, the, the whole promise of matter is that it's not a walled garden. You right. Know? That, that's... That's the that's the fun thing about it. And to have more companies on board like, OK, you know, Amazon saying, hey, you know, you want to watch Thursday Night Football? Um, you can you can. Uh, what do they call it? No, I forget. Uh, uh, we we can matter cast it to your television. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That sort of thing. Like all of that stuff makes a lot of sense to me. I feel like matter has been this promise of interoperability for some time, but uh, always felt a little theoretical rather than, you know, productive. Yeah, yeah. And I, it relies on a lot of players getting into the, the pool, if you will. And unfortunately, you will always still have that one giant holdout. And it'll be Apple. Yeah. No, it will for sure. Uh, although you'll be able to use Prime Video on iOS to Mattercast to a Mattercast capable TV, which right now is just a Fire TV. But I, I'll give Amazon the credit on this one. They're using the standard. Yes. Uh, and they, they only have control over their own devices. Them saying like, hey, Plex and Stars are going to do it too. That's cool. That's not them benefiting Amazon. That's them also adopting the standard, which they're probably doing because Amazon did it and they wouldn't have done it otherwise. So you kind of need these steps to eventually get it to be a standard. So yes. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not knocking the effort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the slightest. I, I just, we've seen this 
promise. We've mm-hmm. seen the hope of interoperability. We've, I've just been burned before and I yeah, can't open yeah, my heart yeah. again. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, as a matter of fact, Sarah, there, there, there is another announcement that goes the opposite direction from Mattercast. Yeah, and that one comes from LG, which also announced Chromecast functionality in its new 2024 lineup of TVs. Uh, LG's WebOS platform didn't previously support Chromecast, although it has supported Apple AirPlay since 2019. So, hey, we're all playing um, together in the pool. Yeah. We just uh, you have to know which devices support which protocols to cast yeah, to which. It's still things. it's still a little bit of a mess, but I feel like we're getting closer. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, Molly. So far at CES, you've moderated a conversation about the convergence of AI and climate tech. Uh, you went to Supernal's EV tall announcement, uh, and you took a hyperloop to get here to the Central Hall. Apparently, I, I accidentally yeah. wandered into the hyperloop. <gasps> uh, yep. Yep. So that was fun. That's fun. Uh, let's let's talk Supernal. Let's talk EVTOL. This is this is Hyundai's uh, effort, right? Yeah, it's a Hyundai Motors division, basically, and they formed. They were sort of a. They announced a, like a pre prototype in 2020, apparently, and didn't have a name yet. It was sort of just a guy who'd been at NASA for 30 years and Hyundai, seeing mm-hmm. what they could do. And now they have coalesced into Supernal. And they had a big announcement this morning right before this show. And I'm really, so EVTOL, electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, right? That's right. what that stands for. And I'm excited about the potential of these because they represent a very sort of sustainability mobility step. Now, there are a lot of hurdles, mm-hmm. right? I will I will give the same critique that I give to Amazon, which is like, you got to get people to accept flying cars mm-hmm. or buses or Party or whatever buses or, you know, yeah, yeah. whatever they're going to be, but they're all electric. They're short hop vehicles that are in theory being built to FAA standards in terms of safety. And um, as they talked about in this press event today or alluded to, mm. it's likely that this is the kind of thing that's going to appear in, let's say, Europe first, where they're already effectively banning short haul flights, jet fuel fl- flights for climate reasons. So this is really considered a very promising technology. There are already drones that use this vertical takeoff and landing technology with batteries, but that obviously carrying of passengers would be a big jump forward. Yeah. So they got to meet all those FAA hurdles of part parts one, two, and three, the production certification, air carrier pass, all of that stuff, yep, right? Yeah. Exactly. So the supernal, so the the concept that they unveiled today. I mean, by the way, just like classic CES awesomeness. It, it felt like the good old days of CES where I was just sitting in a chair and then a wall went up and there was a freaking airplane <laughs> and it's like an electric plane. It's got a million. It's big too, right? Like this isn't that personal thing like we were talking about earlier that, oh, you, no, it's that you can buy, but it's small. Yeah, this is huge. Yeah, this carries up to four passengers plus a pilot. It's uh, initially, they say they're going to be doing commercial flights by 2028 and that it'll initially be 20 to 45 mile hops. So like a typical mm-hmm. sort of helicopter trip or like up and down, like coastal hops mm-hmm. is kind of a big um, Yeah, if you're a billionaire in the audience, your helicopter trip to the airport might be replaced by one of these. Hopefully. But, or if you're but, not a billionaire. But if you're like, not a billionaire, you might actually be able to take one of these. Right. Yeah, right? Like you yeah. could take this to JFK, mm-hmm. you know, or, or to LAX. God help you. <laughs> Instead of driving Man, across I, Los Angeles. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're in the same category as Joe B mm-hmm. and Whisk. But they, they do have that Hyundai Motors kind of backing so a lot of money a lot of battery tech development because of course i think a huge amount of uh what will determine the success or not is whether they can get big enough batteries made cheaply enough to make this thing work they say it's a modular design though so that as battery technology improves they can just swap it in and out oh that's good well hyundai has some good uh, modular uh systems going on in their other vehicles so having them be the backer of this or the organizer owner of it is is an advantage because you know as soon as you get all of your approvals you can ramp up manufacturing much more quickly than you would if you need to find a partner right and you know you're not starting from scratch like a i mean i and all due respect to joby they've yeah, done yeah, incredible yeah. work in the ev tall space but you're not starting from scratch there you've got a huge kind of it's a bigger hill to climb infrastructure yeah. behind you yeah also let me just stress again how fun it is like it was <laughs> I haven't been to CES in a lot, in several years, and how fun it is to just sit in a room and have a wall come up in there. And, be and there's a there. giant SUV. That's what I'm here for. Airplane there. Yeah. Let's go. So you're going to get in one of these, it sounds like. 
Chance sure. it takes off. Sarah, 100%. what about you? Uh, sure. Yeah. All right. So I, we can, I, I mean, Tom, what about you? Like, are there any solved. like crazy flags? No, I just prefer to take my own helix. You know, my personal <laughs> aircraft. Of course. Yeah. Sure. That's, that's what's going to happen. We're going to have all these people with helixes. Helices? He, he, the one you the one he, you can buy yourself. Elixis. <laughs> yeah, that what you said. Uh, and then it's going to crowd up the airway. Actually, you can't take that to the airport because you can't fly in the airport. So you would have exactly. to you'd have to be able to take you one of these EV tones. And all joking aside, I I am looking Better forward. A airport. I, I'm looking for these to uh, to become common. I'm looking for these to be the promise that we've been hearing for 10 years. I mean, I, I've co I covered eVTOL the first year of DTNS. I'm, I'm pretty sure I covered it on TNT and even BOL before that. So, I think it, so. it's been a while. Yeah. Much like interoperability and mm -hmm. VR. <laughs> like mo air mobility, electric or otherwise, has long been promised. Yeah. We'll see. Excellent. Uh, well, um, I, 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 anything else on, on, the, uh, on the concept before we wrap up? Molly? I'm thinking, I'm pondering mm -hmm. whether there was anything else I heard um, that is particularly compelling. I, you know, no, I think we hit the high points. Right. Like, it's a hope springs eternal kind of thing. I think we all want to get cars off the road and quiet electric, all electric transportation. Like, the, the barrier to mobility, massive mobility changes, yeah. is always adoption. It's like if it doesn't fit into your workload that you're already used to. Yeah, yeah. 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 People get confused by the idea of taking a little. Yeah, I mean, we talk about that on on DTNS all the time. Is like, you know, you people want the technology, but does it fit into a lifestyle? And that is a really big barrier for a lot yeah. of people. Yeah, I, uh, I I'm glad you brought up the quiet too, because that is a, an advantage. These things are these things are much quieter than a helicopter. I mean, they're not completely silent, but they're like as loud. They talked about how the decibel output would be about the sound of a dishwasher. Just Dis yeah, which I mean, compared the sky, to a helicopter, you know? yeah, much much smaller. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Molly Wood. It is my genuine pleasure to be podcasting with you in person, indeed, above the CS floor. What a treat. Uh, if uh, folks want to find out what you're doing these days, and they very much should, where should they go? They should go to everybodyinthepool.com. New episodes will resume next week. And at mollywood.co, you can subscribe to my newsletter. I'll be posting from here. So I'll have a bunch of photos and videos and a little write-up of the supernal announcement, for example, coming oh, out tonight. right. Yeah, you want to find more details, make sure you get that newsletter. Uh, Sarah, let's say we stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet, and talk about more CES stuff for the patrons. I think that's a great idea, Tom. Uh, just a reminder for everybody, you can catch our show live. We do it live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We will be back tomorrow giving you more CES coverage with Trisha Hirschberger and Scott Johnson joining us. See you then. The DTNS family of podcasts helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>